Okay. Hello, Cape Town. So it's just after lunch, and I know a lot of you have pff, sugar problems and everything. So just get up and high five the person next to you and say, Woo! Two days off work! <laughs> Don't clap each other in the face like the, they, they did that once. Come, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Get up and high five the person next to you. Okay, no one, no one tell our bosses that, hey. That's our secret. Okay, so I've got 45 minutes to teach you guys about accessibility. <laughs> I cannot guarantee, because no, South African English, brew, my brew, you know, my china, let's go get some chow. It just, this is US English, I found it was the closest that we can get in. If I talk like this about the American political system, then it picks me up a lot, but I'm not going to go all nasal on you. <laughs> so you can follow along, if you guys have laptops or on your phone, you can go to acca.ms scaleconf. I've created a whole blog that has these PowerPoints and more information, contact details, and all of my details on site on LinkedIn Point Drive, which is really cool, so you can do that. And please tweet me up there also. So let's start. So that URL, ScaleConf. So how did I get into this talk? So let me start with a little bit about me. So I have dwarfism, achondroplasia. And it means also that I'm pretty short. And so I've adjusted my entire life for you tall people, and these are my car pedals. I built a false floor, I put car pedals onto there, and I, and this is very important to the theme of this talk, I bolted it on, onto the car, which is actually a 335R, which is a midlife crisis. Come to me if you want to know what to do with your midlife crisis and what not to do. Don't buy a car. And like that, I also have just made a plan in my life. So this is me speaking at the University of Bloemfontein. Any Bloomies here? They, they're so refined and they're so polite. <laughs> and this is me trying to get coffee at work and one of my employees. And you know, coffee is important to me. Tequila is even more important. They gave me tequila last, last, last night with Tabasco. No, it's a bad idea, Cape Town. So I make a plan. I bolt on things. And it's similar with the historical assistive technologies for bolt-on. We've got the sip and puff switch. Someone said, yeah, sip and pass, but puff and pass, and they said, no, this is not that type of talk. And then we have the keyless keyboard, which allows you to actually choose it if you are limited movement. Similarly, if you've got visual impairments, historically you have the refreshable braille keyboard, and you have the screen reader software, JAWS, which is the stock standard industry leader. But something happened recently. Now going through my midlife crisis, which I've already shared with you, I bought one of those BMI scales. So I put it down, and I get on it, and I put in my heart, four foot one, I don't know how, it's very it's few centimeters, I think 120 centimeters, and then I put in my weight, 65 kilos, and pushed all the buttons there, got on it, jumped on it, and it did a little bit of a calculation. You can see that there was a model there thinking, and it came out and it called me horrid names, though. I'm not going to say that's a little bit offensive, but like the worst names, and I was thinking like, it didn't occur to me to actually you know, lose the weight, but it would occur to me, why and how would someone do this? This is an industry 4.0 device, and how did they manage to mess this up so much? And I felt a little bit like, Sad Affleck. Because what was happening is I was going to be left behind. And the key to accessibility is that you have to make sure that people don't feel left behind. So I gave myself a challenge. I like to actually do the most difficult parts by challenges. I was going to actually work out how that scale worked. And I was going to try and influence others to improve their knowledge about accessibility. So what are we going to talk about today? 
So with that scale, I identified three core parts to learning how to do it. One, inclusive design. There had to have been a meeting at some point with that scale that said, hey guys, let's design a product, and how are we gonna design it? And inclusive design looks at accessibility as not a bolt-on, but as part of the design process. Two, website standards. We all do websites. We all understand that the web is the portal to the digital realm. And finally, <laughs> AI. If any of you were standing there, I built a toxic AI and it took me very quick to do that. Now would you take that toxic aware AI to production? How do you build an AI who is empathetic? So let's look at it. So step one, inclusive design. Now this is core to the Microsoft paradigm of design, but it's not only us. Every other large software house also includes this. So inclusive design takes a different look at accessibility. Accessibility, the design of products, services, environments that everyone, including people with disabilities, can fully experience them. And what it does is says that it's a journey rather than a bolt-on. If you start with inclusive product and service design, you look at accessibility compliance, which is a necessary uh, legislation, you can increase your productivity and bring in innovation. It's a very hard concept to grasp and to believe in, so becoming accessible increases innovation. So let's look at how, how we can do that. The cornerstone, disability is not a personal health condition. Have you ever been to a doctor and he says, sorry, I can't help you, you've got disability. It doesn't work like that. There are one billion people in this world with a disability. They're friends and family, 2.4 billion people. That means that majority of the people are vested, have a vested interest in disability. Who here is colorblind? Or maybe they don't know it yet. Do you consider yourself having a disability? No, you have a mismatched human interaction with the tools and the systems that haven't catered for you. So disability is not a personal health condition. It's a mismatched human interaction. Disability is only aware once you have that mismatch. The inclusive design steps. One, learn from diversity. Being able to understand how to cater for people with the color blindness, you have to understand, wait a second, how does that affect their interaction with systems? Two, solve for one, extend to many. And we'll look at some examples. Once you solve for some one disability, chances are you're including other disabilities as part of that spectrum. And three, learn from diversity. That's when the innovation comes in. Because if you have solved for one extent to many, chances are you'll be able to spot and learn more diverse engagements. So it's a little bit small, but here's your persona spectrum. So we're gonna take a case of someone with one arm. So the person with one arm actually fits in the same spectrum as an arm injury and also a person holding their newborn baby, a new parent. So that person at the top might only be a very small population, 26,000. The permanent disability. The temporary disability, 13 million. These are actual stats. And the situational dis disability, parents, 8 million. So it means that if you cater for the permanent disability of 26,000, you're actually including 21 million people in your inclusive design. Just from identifying those persona spectrums. Let's take that persona spectrum and apply it to a shopping cart sample. So I've got my shopping cart sample here. It's got my site landing, preferences, registration, help and login, all part of the registration, navigation, search products, add to cart, help, and then your checkout process, checkout shopping, and then a review on experience. 
We apply our personas there with the limited movement of the arm, and we follow the same process that we do there, and we see how does that person engage. I know that I've got limited movement, so I know that I want to actually make the mobile device accessible to one-handedness. An example that I use also in this, if you want to see how many people are in the spectrum, take your smartphone and dial 951 with one hand. No, 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 seriously, take your smartphone and dial 951. Dial it with one hand, like our spectrum here. Put up your hands if you could dial all three numbers with one hand. Put up your hands if you could dial two with one hand. Few. Put up your hands if you could dial one, one of the numbers with one hand. Put up your hands if you could dial none of them with one hand. So because I fit into that spectrum of being and needing an accessible, I would be with the one, two, and three, even though I can't access any of the numbers. So we've got our persona spectrum, and we, we look at there and we say, hey, wait, wait, wait a second, while we're doing preferences or one-handers, we can also add font and color actions. And we proceed through the entire spectrum, voice search, one button control, callback for help, SMS and email option, one button access, and then AI adjustment for the experience. Ask the person, how did this work for you? What would you like? And then the AI would adjust this according to, instead of dialing 159, make it only that he can't dial one of the numbers. So we've looked at inclusive design. It's as simple as that. You take the persona spectrum, you apply it to your journey, and then we look at the actual programming, the deep tech, website accessibility. And I'd like to actually look at a quote for that. For most of human history, we put our innovative capacity in improving the quantity of life. Because we're living longer, our focus is starting to shift towards improving our quality of life. The drive now for accessibility is actually part of human evolution. And of course, legislation, because who wants to actually be jailed for not being accessible? And we can thank the US federal government, thank you US federal government, that said by 2020 and 2021, uh, or websites, public-facing websites and mobile apps for civil use have to be accessible or punishable by a fine and or a jail sentence. That'll get them going. <laughs> of course, on the other side of the pond, we have the EU standards also, which means that if you're working for a government institution and you don't have an accessible website, you're in trouble. This created such an incre increased awareness of accessibility, similar to the usage of privacy and storage of data, GDPR. And the standard that we're looking at is WCAG. We can just call it WAG, and then Y. So Web Accessibility, Web Components for Accessible Guidelines. So what is it? What is WAG? So, released a long time ago, 1999, the time of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. It had 14 guidelines and 62 checkpoints. Of course, we were cleverer. WAG 2, 14 principles, 12 guidelines, and 61 success criteria. And finally, 2.1, which increased mobile low visibility and learning disabilities. Learning disabilities, ADHD which means that if you don't cater for people for ADHD on a public-facing website, you're breaking the law in America and EU. There's some compliance levels, and it's very simple. Level A, the minimum you need to do. Pretty simple. So what is the minimum? Actually having captions, like I'm doing here with PowerPoint, and captioning your videos or your sound. Having the correct contrast ratios for your text, which we'll look at examples also. 
and also having the correct keyboard navigation accessible browsing. Level AA signifies the biggest and most common barriers for disabled users. If you give them the option to not view the video, give them the option to pause if they are battling with being able to click the mouse quick enough. And the final AAA addresses the highest and most complex level of web accessibility. So most companies and most civil societies expect AA. So let's go through the categories. So there's three categories. Perceivable, can you see it? Operable, can you use it? Understandable, can you understand it? And robust, it won't break future technologies. So, perceivable. If I have a picture, create an alt text for it. A lot of the tools and technologies now will create an alt text for you automatically. The PowerPoint slides that I've given you are part of that link. I've used the AI to actually look at the pictures. When it saw Sad Affleck, it just said Sad Man. Didn't really know who Ben Affleck was, though. I don't think Ben Affleck wants to know who Ben Affleck is right now. It's fine, he's left the DC universe. And that's not a cute care, that's a little high, high evolved killing machine. But create, create your alts. Also, the visual representation of your errors. Don't rely on colors to convey meaning. Because this is the color of an email address that is incorrect, and this is what it looks like to someone who's colorblind. Create your visual representation. Create a pop-up to say, this isn't working. Rate your visual presentation. Oh, America. <laughs> color contrast. Okay, so this is the correct color contrast. You've got blue, red, tick. This is the incorrect one. Now the contrast checker there, you can access it there, and it will check, and PowerPoint will also check, and a lot of tools will check, wait a second, this color contrast can't work. And it takes the entire spectrum of most of the color blindness, the um, accessible requirements, and works out how to do that, text size also. Video captions. This is my boy, Ron Swanson, Parks and Recreation. And anyone who knows him will know that there is no laughing. So whoever put this here actually got the captions wrong. Rewatch the videos that you do. Put the captions there. Don't rely on the YouTube auto captions. Hey, those things are terrible. We're, we're South Africans, bro. We're not gonna get everything right the first time. But look at your captions. Caption also your, your sound, your audio. And review it, transcribe it. Hyperlinks. <laughs> so there's a few rules with hyperlinks. Stick to the standard usage. Also, don't have a click here for a hyperlink. Actually have the physical hyperlink. So I've used the JAWS reader for many times, and when I've accessed the page, it says, click here. I go, what? No, to a person who has visual impairment, the words click here is not gonna help you. You actually have to have the hyperlink name in there. And of course, we've all, we've all copied from Stack Overflow, okay? That's why it's there. <laughs> and this is our ideal keyboard, Control C and V. <laughs> but make sure that your website is navigable by keyboard. Tab it. Go into your website and go tab, 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 tab. Take your mouse away for a day. See how easy or difficult it is to navigate off your website. The tab index, if you don't know what you're doing, just leave the tab index as zero. Don't mess with it. HTML. This is a standard HTML little site there, and they, they're doing the right thing. He's using H1, he's using the right tags, and you can use the semantic tags also. And he's got a list. A nice, normal, ordered list. But when, you, you know when it's like 
you know, go live crunch. We all do kind of stuff like this. We use the screwdriver, sorry, the, the hammer to actually hammer in a screw. We make the font sizes irrelevant, the line spacing to reflect paragraphs, and we create lists with BRs. To a screen reader, a visually impaired person, that is a nightmare. Understandable. Is your system understandable? So this guy here has a volume slider where he's busy pumping it up though. It's not too bad. This one, you have to scream loud enough there to set the similar volume. And my favorite, you have to actually create and understand gear ratios to set your volume in the correct time. So I'm not saying that it's, you, you guys create as bad as this though, but if you have an error, prompt for it. Don't have a visual representation or something like that. Work out, is this understandable to someone who might also have cognitive issues? Create your spectrum for cognition. Scalable, robust. Yeah, I've got my little sausage dog, and I've got schnauzers, hey? And the person who sold me the schnauzer didn't actually tell me that they howl at four o'clock in the, in the morning every morning in unison. And then the male kind of gets so that he's not actually getting as much as the female, and then he ups the pitch, and the female ups the pitch, and everything like that, and I'm thinking, <sighs> make it robust. Most accessible requirements on mobile. Not only that, but the, the new 2.1 requirements is that you can flip the mobile upside down. Make sure you can do it landscape or por portrait. Make it responsive. Don't only make responsive design for people who could use your product. Make it for people who battle to use your product. So we've gone through WAG. Now we're going to go through ARIA. This is the next step. ARIA says, with WAG, is what is the minimum requirements and how do you uh, create your website to be usable? ARIA takes one step further. It actually says, how do you make it rich for people with disabilities. And it's broken up into four categories. Role attributes, what is that device, that widget supposed to do? Even though it's a button and you've hyperlinked it, is it a button? Live regions, you've got a carousel that moves over there. Do you know how incredibly difficult that is to understand for someone who's visually impaired? Landmark roles, that is supposed to perform a function. That's supposed to perform a function. States and property, I clicked the button, guess what, it's actually clicked. To so us, simple. So ARIA is markup. Your roles, main role equals to main. State, ARIA input equals to true. And properties, first name, ARIA required equals to true. It's the same as your normal markup. ARIA is HTML5. ARIA came about at the same time as the HTML wars were happening, when they're trying to work out what the standards were supposed to be. So if you've created a good semantic HTML5 website, you're actually ARIA compliant. But if you've done what I showed you there with that list, all you've done is set the wrong expectations. The first rule of ARIA, really, No ARIA is, bad, is uh, better than bad ARIA. Don't attempt to create rich applications if you're not heavily invested in that. Just use semantic HTML5. The second rule of ARIA, do not use if you, uh, HTML tags if they provide the same functionality. So, we've also got two principles. A role is a promise. If you press that button, it's pressed. And the principle two, it can both cloak and enhance, creating power and danger. So the first one there, we've got an A tag there. A sifter tech users perceive this element as an item in a menu, not a link. Because you put the role equals to menu item, even though it's an A tag. The second one, ARIA label, because existive tech users can only perceive the contents of this ARIA label, not the link text. 
because you've marked it as a label. You really can put a stumbling block in front of someone who requires you to have accessible knowledge. So if you're battling for it, don't use it. So WSC, AG, or WAG, your existing systems and how to cater for accessibility. ARIA is how to create rich, engaging applications for people with accessibility. Okay, so I've got a demo and you guys can all follow it. It's all compliant on your website, so you can go acca.ms scale conf demo. And we're gonna see two sites. And this is from the WSCG site. The first site has some bad, bad uh, accessibility compliance. And the second site is compliance. So I've got it open here. And we've got welcome to City Lights. And City Lights is your accessible site. And I've got at the top there, inaccessible and accessible. You can use this as examples of how to create accessible websites. And anyone who can notice, I'm actually mousing on my hand with my little trackpad, Logitech. And I've got my inaccessible website. And you can see their image. Great, that's great. That's accessible alt No, it's not. And over here, no alt. You can click on show annotations, and it will show you the annotations and each of the errors. But the interesting thing is if I go to the accessible site there, what's gonna change? Nothing. Because the accessible and the inaccessible is actually the same. Because to you and I, the differences aren't actually noticeable. But to someone with a screen reader, or visually impaired, or cognitive difficulties, or one of the 2.5 billion people out there invested in, uh, in accessible requirements. It means the world to them. So you can actually go there, and then we can switch on annotations. And it will annotate there, and it will show you the HTML, and it will say there, the text uh, alternate for this image is overly verbose and does not serve as the equivalent purpose. Uh, I want the home, yeah. Two, this image does not have any text alternatives. And you can see there, it doesn't exist to someone who's visually impaired. And so forth and so forth. Link is not visually distinct. And then here's our little LRs, our lists. So it resembles a list, but the structural information does not represent the HTML code. Because they've taken links there and they've just created that BR nightmare that I mentioned. So once you have this, you can also run it with your accessible tooling. So we can create our little report. Now I'm using Lightbox, which is actually part and built into the Chrome Web Tools. So I've got set it up to actually use accessibility, and I just run a report, generate report. And it'll tell me color contrast is satis it's not satisfactory, and it'll give me examples for that. Free penguins, more city parks, color cost is incorrectly. The language is not specified. Elements don't use the attributes, the alt correctly. Failing elements. Form elements not used well, and so forth and so on. And this is built into every single Chrome browser, the accessibility checks, WCAG 2.0. You should run this every single time you push to production. What am I missing? What can't I see? You don't have to use a screen reader or an accessible checker. It's built into your browsers. Let's have some fun. So of course, the scale did some maths, did some modeling, took a model, popped it in there, and it's, you could say that it's AI. AI for accessibility. So I like to actually use the example of does AI understand me? So first of all, I am not in any way related to Peter Dinklage, and that didn't work. 
So I used Azure Cogn Cognitive Services, and I sh it's my favorite T-shirt. I don't do kids' bodies, which I don't do kids' bodies. Okay, ask me afterwards. Maybe it depends on the. And here's the <laughs> Peter Dinklage. And there is a. This is actually mis There's a hundred percent chance. It's actually zero to one. Zero point five is actually being a hundred percent. So this is a high probability. I am not this person. And you can use these services because. In the beginning of my AI journey, I thought maybe let me actually just play around with it. Let me use it for nefarious services. And I created, using Amazon Alexa, a pass the butter robot. Because I wanted my personal slave, because that's what we do, hey. Like, oh, look, technology, let me use it for my own self-interest. And I was sitting next to on the flight here to, with Werner Vogels, who thought, thought this was really, really funny, hey. So he said, did you manage to do that? I said, yes, I actually did. but." It was very difficult because I had to scream at it constantly because it didn't understand my emotions, that it wasn't passing the butter. What do we want out of an AI? We want an AI to adapt to our individual requirements. Take these stairs here. These stairs can adapt to any persona spectrum that requires. These stairs are also can uh, adapt to the elderly. You can wheelchair or not wheelchair accessible. In the future, what we envisage is that AI will adapt to each of our requirements. Of course, if you saw that me uh, earlier today, I created a toxic AI, not, not everyone gets it right. You have to train it and test it. Because AI is not a zero or one binary sentiment. It's an emotional spectrum. So the emotional spectrum here. So interestingly here, on this emotional spectrum, we've got boredom equals disgust equals to loathing. So this is the evolutionary emotional model. Scientists believe that boredom is an evolutionary response to uh, your body being poisoned. So if you do feel bored right now, we have paramedics out there that will actually give you a, a shot of Netflix to help you actually get through it. <laughs> but it's important because this spectrum is complex. So the bright guys in MIT, they uh, did an example, and they created Deepmoji, the most advanced artificial emotional intelligence. And how they did that, they trained 55 billion tweets that have been hashtagged with emojis. Why is the hashtag important? Because it's someone actually listing the emotional sentiment and uh, or of every tweet, even if they might be doing it out of jest. They cleaned it out to 1.6 billion. They categorized it. And the categories we want to look here specifically are the negative sentiment ones. And my favorite here, the I'm not impressed face. AKA, sarcasm. I'm not impressed. So of course, I went there and I put the sarcastic statement, which was very relevant to South Africans. The electricity is off again. Oh, joy. And Deepmoji gave me the sentiment flow back. Not impressed. I'll kill someone. Anger. <laughs> anger. High confidence. So you guys can, it's mobile friendly. You can go in there. So next time, and you can even use the the model, and it's constantly learning. You can use the model to actually determine sentiment. Sent sarcasm is very difficult to understand. A lot of people get it. Next time you're looking at a review or a Twitter profile or feed, pass it through Deepmoji, the world's most advanced artificial emotional intelligence. But each one of your laptops actually also has an emotional intelligence. Cortana. Cortana has feelings. I've met and introduced myself and we have a team there to actually help people who are battling with it understand that the assistant feels. Because the last thing you want to do is scream at that artificial intelligence to the point that you feel that it's not listening. And it has all of these emotional spectrums and more. But we want more. Playground.tensorflow.org. Web 4.0. We're starting to bring AI directly into the browser 
You can go play around with this, and this is a convolutional neural network in your browser. What does this mean? It means that the AI, with the help of these technologies, TensorFlow, Python, JavaScript, can actually learn each person's accessible requirements in the browser without ever hitting the server offline. So, your accessible little assistant. What happens if someone can't actually speech, speak? How are they supposed to use it? Simple. Smart assistant with sign language. You can also all go there to acker.ms forward slash scaleconf ASL, it's the GitHub repo. And what they did is they took an Amazon Alexa, I'm allowed to say that because Alexa works with Cortona now, and I spoke to Werner Vogels and he found it very impressive. So this individual here used TensorFlow to train up on sign language, to learn it in the browser, using a convolutional network in the web worker, using the web cache, never hitting the server, to actually speak to his Amazon Alexa for him. So using that there, you can actually go see the code base on how to do it. It's all in JavaScript, every single line in the browser. Once we've got our AI, and it's fully integrated in our life, we need to let it learn from diversity. You need to understand that bias is a spectrum. You can't just let the AI learn without engaging with it. Enlist customers to correct bias. We saw how the tweets helped us learn emotional sentiment. Cultivate diversity with privacy and consent. Don't use your client's data to build your AI. Balance intelligence with discovery. It doesn't have to be perfectly intelligent, your AI. And then build inclusive AI teams. You saw the websites, the two websites that we had there that was almost impossible to determine the differences for a visually capable person. When you build your AIs, look for inclusive AI teams. So we have a hackathon that came up with this AI called the Seeing AI. It's iPhone compatible and it can navigate and narrate your entire world. Newspapers, people, people's faces, colors, sounds, everything that you see around you. And people are using it now to be able to look at the entire world. Because to us, if I see a room here of 400 people, then I can adjust my persona and my actions. But to visually impaired people, they might not see it. So that visual AI, the seeing AI, would be able to tell you how many people in a room and this was created because we created a diverse AI team of people with accessible requirements who came up with this AI. Happy Affleck. <laughs> so to conclude, inclusive design. Start your design. Don't have a bolt on. Don't jump onto the coffee machine from the beginning. Look at how you can create those spectrums. Look at your journeys. Be empathetic. Learn from those journeys. Website standards, pretty simple. If you're HTML5, you're already compliant. How long until those publicly facing legislations come down to private websites? Two years? Three years? Start now. And AI. How long until every single website has an accessible AI on the website, learning from you, adjusting to you, creating those steps that would be able to include 100% of accessibility. Thank you very much. If you can, go to there, rate me, get the content, get all of the demos, tweet me up. Thank you very much. And questions. I was really impressed with the whole idea of being able to 
um, reach a, a spectrum of people if you cater for a small subgroup by proxy. And it occurred to me that it's actually very nice in a South African context. You know, we have 11 national languages and we have a lot of, we have a high literacy level. So what you're actually doing is by proxy, if you're, if you're catering for accessibility for, for people with special needs, what you're actually gaining is, is such a wider spread accessibility for people who can't read, who can't speak a specific language, who can't speak English, one of the major governmental languages. And I think you're that's also You're also going to cater for people with dementia. Yes. You're also going to cater for the elderly who can't actually respond in time. And you're going to learn from empathy by actually catering for those things. Thank you.